so welcome everybody to this roundtable, AI in production, now the hard part. So my name is Grégoire Martinon, I'm data scientist at Quantmetry, and I'm, uh, I have the pleasure to uh, host with me uh, four uh, participants. Alors, we have with us uh, Jacob Montiel. So, Jacob Montiel, uh, you have been lead engineer at G Aviation in Mexico in a global team working in aircraft engine predictive maintenance. After five years as a software engineer, you moved to research and got a PhD in machine learning at Telecom Paritech. Now, Jacob is a researcher at the University of Waikato in New Zealand and your field of research is machine learning on data streams. Um, you, you are also the lead developer of Scikit Multiflow, a Python library providing tools for stream mining. Welcome, uh, Jacob, to this round table. Uh, we also welcome uh, John Whitbeck. So John, you have a PhD in computer science. Uh, you worked at Criteo for a while, and six years from now, uh, you co-founded Liftoff, a growing global company in mobile apps advertising. So today you are head of machine learning at Liftoff, uh, leading distri distributed machine learning teams in Paris and Palo Alto in California. And today, Liftoff is managing 300 million predictions per day, uh, per second, and is automatically retraining hundreds of models every single day. <laughs> Thank you. I, I didn't co-found Liftoff. I just want to you clarify. No, no, no. I, 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 I've been okay. a reg regular employee. Okay, okay. You, you, <laughs> you are still the head of uh, yes. machine learning at Liftoff. Uh, Renan. Welcome, Renan, uh, to this round table. You. So uh, you worked 15 years at Société Générale, Corporate and Investment Banking, focusing on electronic trading. It has been three years from now that uh, you have moved to AXA Investment Managers, as chief architect, uh, you are in charge of data for the technology department focusing on transformation. Uh, AXA EM is managing more than uh, $700 billion of assets spread over 5,000 clients all around the world, and it represents uh, more than 2,000 employees. And finally, Eloise. Uh, welcome to this round table. So, Eloise, you. you have a PhD in quantum physics. Uh, you are now head of data science and data engineering at ITNOVEM, the SNCF expertise center in machine learning and data engineering. Uh, you are managing a team of 30 people focused on building AI solutions uh, and putting them into production. Use cases at uh, SNCF range from energy consumption to travelers' mobility knowledge. And in four years, 90 projects have been managed from cloud infrastructure to end-to-end -end software applications. SNCF is actually operating 15,000 trains every day and manages more than 270 terabytes of data on the cloud. So welcome to all the participants to this round table. Um, so AI in production is hard, and uh, we are discussing the hard part uh, in this round table. And what is hard? It is model life cycle. What is model life cycle? The very definition of what is a life cycle depends on the person you ask. So uh, Jacob, as a researcher in uh, stream mining, uh, do you have thoughts on model life cycle? Uh, since you experienced in your work the volatility of uh, machine learning prediction, could you explain why should models be re constantly retrained in uh, real-world applications? Yes. So what we are seeing now is that uh, data is being generated in a high scale. And what we are seeing is that basically this data is changing. If we are considering this, what we have seen in the past is basically a pipeline where we were training a, m a model and then we were using that model and that was fine. That was like, okay, we are done with the job. But the reality of it when we move to real world applications is that actually those models uh, need to be retrained basically because data is continuously changing. This is uh, the case for many real world applications, for example, in financial systems where markets are evolving. So basically what is happening is that the, new, the data that is incoming, maybe it's different to what the model has seen in the past. So what was happening is that we are training a model on some data 
and then this model is applied and it's working for some time until something new is coming. So what is happening there is that basically the model doesn't know that there is a different data. So the, for the model, this new data is kind of like noise. And basically it's going to give you back some uh, answers based on what it, it has seen, but not what it's seeing now. And this is what, uh, why it's hard, because basically now we are getting a lot of data, a lot of features, we are introducing more data, and this is good for business, because we are basically adding more data as, uh, as, as it's generated and as it is uh, uh, made available. But this is very hard for models, because basically they are not designed to take this into account. And this is where uh, we need to work on, on this uh, retraining and basically saying, okay, this is new data and you need to, to, to be aware of this. And so basically we get into a loop where we are retraining models. Yes, indeed, data is evolving. That is not taught in uh, machine learning uh, courses. But uh, it's a reality. It's a reality of the world. Um, Renan, at uh, AXA IM, so you are managing very large amount of uh, assets. So I presume the notion of risk is fundamental to your business. So in practice, uh, how to evaluate the risk of a model and how to mitigate it? Can the notion of risk be integrated in the model life cycle? Thank you. Good, good question. First, uh, we need to have a look to the kind of model we are speaking about. In fact, there are many different models, uh, simple one which can be automation of processes, basic processes of a company, or you can have models to try to get some trends about what are doing your clients, <clears throat> what could be the good marketing strategy. So it's not, it, it, it won't lead to operational decision. Or in your case, you can have very complex things linked to finance, where you are going to try to find new signals to enrich your existing model, which are relying on basic fina finance, uh, let's say requirements, but we, we, we knew it for a while now. So in the first case, the challenge is more to integrate those models in our ecosystem, i.e. To, to organize monitoring supervision like any other application. And we are going to detect issues. Okay, it is broken, but there is not, it's not a big deal. The execution is failing, but we, can, we are able to monitor it and after to have the right mitigation plan. So this is our first, first, first one. Second one, let's say we are not going to focus that more on it. I, data trends, data trends, people will, will have a look after. They are going to analyze the result of a model, they are going to discuss about it, and so on and so forth. So actually there is no need to mitigate during the execution of the model. It will be afterwards. Then we are reaching the, the, the more complex one, which is new signals uh, to run reach the investment decision making process. And here, to be honest, even if we are freaking out about it, there is still a human being around. Why? Because to back test, to see, you, you can have many issues coming from your model. Your model itself, the data, and one of our challenges is to get new data, alternative data. So there is not a long history around it. So for sure, we have many issues. The, the main mitigation for risk is to correlate the outcome of those models with another context. It can be the standard, let's say, <coughs> model we had before, uh, quant libraries, or it can be uh, to have more information for portfolio managers, so this is why uh, human being is still around today. And uh, what we're going to try to achieve is to automate the testing, the back testing, even during production phase. But I think we are going to discuss about this capability in the next question. Yes. Thank you very much, Renan. So if I resume, monitoring is the key to, uh, to just evaluate the risk. And of course, the human is more intelligent than the machine. So mitigating the risk is also a human business. Um, Eloise, uh, you are familiar with building end-to-way uh, AI application at uh, SNCF. So according to you, uh, where does an AI project begin and where does it end? and what is the hardest part in model life cycle? Thank you for the question. It's, um, it's uh, actually the hardest part is the beginning uh, of the project and the end of the project. In between, you have experts and data scientists designing models and it's more, uh, it's kind of easier. Uh, it really starts with understanding what's the real business needs uh, for AI in the sense that um, 
people, uh, operators are going to tell you, I need, I don't know, predictive maintenance, but what you will have to do is to come up with a much more precise needs. If you want to put AI in production, that means that, I agree with you, um, Ronan, you need to take a decision, but on something operational. So what type of decision is going to be taken? Is it critical or not? And um, you need to really focus on this, uh, this need to design the correct solution. Uh, let me gi give you an example to be more concrete. Uh, SNCF, we have a network of uh, railways uh, and we have points. We have 3,000 points on the network. So a point is actually a device that allows the train to go left or right uh, at some points uh, on the network. And they have engines moving the points on the left position, on the right position. So they move very often every day. And of course, there is maintenance and surveillance issues uh, to, to survey this, uh, those devices. Uh, this is fully operational. We operate 15,000 trains a day. In Paris, it's, it's, it's 6,000. And uh, so it's very critical, actually, and security is involved. So if we want to predict or identify, detect an anomaly, um, we have to focus in designing the models, what we are doing right now, um, on e exactly what we want to find. So do we need to find a critical anomaly that will trigger an immediate decision in operation, having high costs, of course, because we would have to stop trains, we have, would have to involve operators, or should we try to anticipate? And it's completely different kind of solution to those two types of way to look at the, uh, at the system. And a decision is going to have a cost, of course, and the model has to be designed according to this. And the second part is actually change management, because once you have AI in production, once you have a system to monitor your model, maybe to retrain them every I don't know, every hour, every month, every year, it depends on uh, your problem. Then you need a, a very long test period in which you involve actually um, operators uh, using the results of the AI. And there will be a lot of exchanges back and forth during this long period, even if you've already reached production. And this is, I think, the hardest part because you work with people not familiar with this new technology and you, you are not familiar with, the, with their processes. So it's two words meeting at the beginning and the end of a project. And um, what you have to think of is it's not going to last three months. It's going to be a lot longer than that and uh, need a lot of investment. Thank you very much for this answer. So indeed, the beginning uh, a project is uh, defining a problem and then the work is not ended when the project is in production, but there is still a lot of work in production. Um, so actually, yes, model life cycle is hard. We understand uh, now why, uh, but still model life cycle is built by people. So who are these people and what do they do? John, uh, as a team leader at Liftoff in uh, mobile apps advertising, you need people to automatize and to end production pipelines. Uh, could you tell us what are the technical skills needed for putting AI in production and how to organize them? Um, yeah, thanks. This is a very timely question for us. Uh, we're in the process of growing and structuring our machine learning team at Liftoff, and part of that involves starting up a new machine learning uh, office here in Paris, uh, which has been up and running for the past two years. Um, my answer won't really surprise you. There are, there are two hard skills you need uh, to operate AI in production. You need strong software engineering skills uh, to build reliable, introspectable ML pipelines. Uh, past a certain scale, in my experience, you run into distributed systems problems. These are not easy. You need to be a good software engineer. Uh, and then obviously you need strong scientific skills to design machine learning models to solve business problems in a scientifically rigorous way. Uh, and those scientific skills also come useful when you have to troubleshoot uh, machine learning problems in production. So you have to be able to 
form good mental intuitions about how uh, your models behave on, um, on new data or, or surprising things. Um, uh, however, uh, as we all know, it's hard to find those two skills in the same person. It's not impossible, but, but hard. Uh, in, in the audience, if you're looking to make yourself very valuable in the jobs market, uh, that is a great combination to have. Uh, but in practice, what you'll observe is that those skills are present among engineers on your team to varying degrees. Uh, and so that brings me to the second part of your question, which is how do you, how do you structure those, those uh, machine learning teams? And um, well, what I'm going to say is based on my personal experience, but also from talking with other engineers and managers at various uh, other tech firms, uh, what I've seen work uh, well for small companies is uh, to actually hire people who can do both. Uh, so it's a little hard. Uh, sometimes if you have one who's better on the software side, you can also hire a data scientist who is stronger on the science side, but also enjoys software engineering. Uh, and you give that team end-to-end -end ownership of your uh, data pipeline. Uh, so everything from the uh, upstream scientific work to putting machine learning models in production, and this guarantees that production constraints will be taken into account uh, from the beginning of, uh, of their work. And because they don't depend on other teams, they can move very, very quickly. Uh, obviously, that doesn't scale infinitely, um, and, and particularly on the recruiting side. And so what I've seen work at larger companies are, are two other ideas. Uh, one of them is to do project-level teams. So I've seen uh, Google do this, Facebook, I think Baidu does this as well. Uh, we've recently exper experimented with it to quite successfully at Liftoff. The idea is you form ad hoc teams, mixing engineers and data scientists to solve specific problems. Again, with end-to-end -end ownership. Uh, the other thing that I've seen more recently, uh, this is coming, there's some very interesting blog posts by Uber, by Stripe, uh, explaining this setup where you define an API between an ML infrastructure team and a data science team. And you know, broadly speaking, the API is you've got these data sources, you've got these features that you can extract from these data sources. And the guarantee is that as long as the data scientists build their models against that API, their models will easily uh, be deployed and, and, and monitored in production. Uh, and so that, allowed, that decouples the work of the infrastructure engineers from the work of the data scientists, I think in a very pro um, productive way. But I think in the long term, liftoff will probably move in that direction. Thank you very much for this answer. So actually, yes, skills, data science skills, data engineering skills, and the solution, the key is to have these skills uh, close to each other. Um, Eloise, in SNCF, as in many other businesses, there is a high demand for people with relevant profiles. Uh, in your experience, what kind of profile is most expected? Well, I, I quite agree with, uh, with John, uh, with the fact that you need hard skills uh, in, in your team designing the system. Um, you also need cloud uh, engineers, uh, data architects, and, well, actually, the, the type of provides you already have in your IT uh, departments. But uh, what I would like to insist on uh, is more in a large organization uh, like SNCF, we also need profiles um, in business teams that actually know, have an expertise on your business. So for instance, a, a point engineer, uh, someone in the marketing, that the, the, the whole range of your expertise, your core business expertise, you need people able to also talk to your uh, expert team in uh, AI and big data technologies. So what they would have to, uh, to do is learn a bit more. And for, of course, you need to find people who have a special interest in that. They would have to learn a bit about AI, a bit about machine learning, a bit about big data to know exactly what are the limits of this technology, these approaches what can they offer, people who know uh, sufficiently to actually abstract from the buzz uh, in the media, uh, to design uh, with your machine learning engineers and your data architect to design the correct solution that's, that is going to be operative, uh, not focusing on 
I don't know, no, no, I want neural network for uh, predictive maintenance. That's not the correct question. Uh, and it's actually the most difficult thing to, uh, to do is to find those people in a large organization uh, to onboard them on this new technology and to make the talk with people you find on the market with some difficulties, of course, but you can find them. Now, the, the question is how you're going to put that team in production, actually. Put the team in production, nice wording. Uh, actually, yes, so it, one thing that people might not think at the first sight is uh, having people able to manage data science project, having people to own project. Uh, this is also a hard skill, a rare skill. Uh, Renan, there is a, an emerging profile that is coming out today that, was that we talk a lot about, that is the so-called uh, machine learning engineer. According to you, what is a machine learning engineer and what are its objectives? Thank you uh, for your question. As I told you, uh, first, I, I do think it's, it's a new buzzword. Not sure that uh, HR will uh, capture what is behind uh, <coughs> in terms of uh, job. So this is first point. Second point, it is potentially somebody we want to hire at AXA. So you can go ground floor, stand one, two, six. So <laughs> this is just, it's done. My HR will be happy to see you. And <coughs> I, I do think it is, uh, as uh, Eloise and John mentioned, it is reflecting the multifacet of data jobs. Uh, we need to understand, uh, you need to understand if you want to be, <coughs> to have a, a such job, you need a data prep, you need to have a little touch of uh, software engineering, you need to understand a little bit the models, and potentially, ultimately, you need to know what is production for the company you, you will decide to work. So I think behind this world, there is multiple skills. I'm not sure that you will be an expert on all the skills, it's still you will be still part of a team, and the team will have all those skills. So this is, to, uh, yeah. in a nutshell, to respond to your point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Machine learning engineer is a, a cursor in a continuous spectrum between data science and data engineering. But the key part is you are part of a team, and the team is uh, polyvalent. Uh, and Jacob, do you have thoughts on this profile, this machine learning engineer? Do you? Well, I think it's. Uh, like like John was mentioning, like, this is something that people are ac actively looking for, but it's very hard in reality to find. Like this, this is a investment that people are doing, and at this point, when we really have the need of this profile, it's going to be very hard. Like uh, I mean, reality, you find people that are good in some aspects, and people who are you. You basically what you want is to have a group of people that are going to. Uh, progress together and work together because this profile of engineering so far is, is very difficult. Like in my case, I was software engineer and then I started doing a PhD in, in machine learning, but that took me some years. So not all the companies have time to wait, uh, to, to wait for people to do this kind of, of investment. Uh, so I think it's kind of something that maybe in the future is going to happen, but at this point it's really not clear. Okay, so being having both skills, uh, yes, Eloise, you want to add some point? I could add something on um, machine learning engineers. Actually, I think that um, the data scientists will and are dividing into different type of profiles. Um, you have academic research, you have something that's more applied research that like you may encounter in companies, and you have uh, actual operational uh, data scientists designing uh, software to go to production. And th there are going to be data scientists who will specialize on data more close to the business side, understanding the need of a business department. And actually in my team, we have people who are more and more specialized, for instance, on the network and some on energy consumption. Just for, from their history because they know data very well. And you have on the other side data scientists who are very much into engineering in the sense of software engineering. And those guys are more technical. Uh, so it's, it's kind of, um, it could be an evolution in a career or it could be a choice uh, after the end of a, a master degree or a PhD degree. Uh, it could be a choice between different 
position, different uh, way to look at machine learning. Yeah. So indeed, there is no one data scientist or data engineer or machine learning engineer profile, but there are different flavors of each of these. Like um, quarks. And different quarks of uh, data scientists, of course. Um, okay, so these are the skills we need uh, for a model life cycle, for putting AI in production. But now we would like to discuss the topic of the solution. So what are the solutions to model life cycle and how to manage it? Um, what could be the model life cycle best practices in terms of technology and project management? Uh, Jacob, as the lead developer of stream mining uh, packages, are there machine learning solutions that tackle the problem of evolving data? Yes. So what we have in, in research is a field that is called stream learning, which is focusing on this kind of problem. So in stream learning, what we are uh, starting or what we are assuming from the beginning uh, is that our data is unbounded. So this means that there is going to be a continuous flow of data coming and we have to deal with that. We have to deal with this reality that there is a lot of information and our model is going to be exposed to, those in, to this information. And if this data is unbounded, well, we are also assuming that it's going to change over time. Uh, so this opens a lot of questions in terms of how we are going to make models that are going to be updating themselves, uh, that are going to be efficient in terms of resources, because they need to be aware that there is a huge amount of data that will be coming. And more precisely, is in this kind of uh, evolution, is models that are going to be designed uh, specifically to, the f to, to be robust against changes. So what, they are, what we are doing in this field is basically providing some mechanisms so models are going to be aware of changes coming from the data. Uh, so they can react faster and they can adapt. So that is the goal in stream learning. And for this, uh, what we have seen so far, it's similar to batch learning, is this effort of providing open source tools. Uh, that's, how, that's why we created Scikit Multiflow, that is a framework, framework in Python. And basically it's, a, it's the chance to uh, take from the academia to uh, industry what we, ha what we are doing so p other people can, can use it, so they can uh, design experiments, run experiments, and also they can extend their own methods and models. Uh, so we started with the idea that uh, in this sense, what we are seeing in now is like a, uh, a lot of people working now in Python, so that's why we wrote it in Python, and also trying to provide with the tools that are going to be useful. For example, it also supports uh, Jupyter Notebooks because a lot of people are now working on Jupyter Notebooks. So in this sense, it's kind of uh, allowing people to see that there is these other options. Uh, so, but in the end, the, the uh, people who are taking these decisions have to go back and, and look into their data and deciding if these solutions are good for their processes and what they have already, uh, but it's a good alternative. Yeah, okay, so stream mining is a model life cycle integrated in the algorithm in some, in some sense. And you mentioned the package scikit-multiflow that you are developing, you are the lead developer of scikit-multiflow. Um, thank you very much for this answer, Jacob. Uh, Renan, at uh, AXA, do you have advices on what kind of architecture or technology are relevant for managing model life cycle? I'm going to respond on what AXA IEM is doing. I do think for AXA group, I think we are using multiple, multiple solutions because we have, got, we have got many companies. But so far, what is important for us, there are two, two dimensions. There is to, to provide autonomy to data scientists and to bridge this with standard software development practice. Those are the two main objectives. But before that, I think it's not exactly a tool, but to set the rule of the games on a governance perspective. Are you allowed to do this with your data? Just even if you are a startup or a big company, I think it's a good question to ask first. And then regarding our technical choices, uh, like Jacob for Jupyter for us has been uh, chosen by our data scientists as their preferred tool. Uh, Python seems to be uh, the standard as well for, for those guys. Uh, now what we are moving on cloud, 
So uh, we, have, we, we, we are working on Azure, not because of data science, because of a global strategy of the company, because for data gravity reason, let's say, you, you need to have your data close to your data scientist environment, which seems better. And today, what we are going to put in place is the same pipelines for data science models than for other applications. I need to have the ability when data scientists are doing ideation process, uh, you can see emerging models. When they are ready to go, push button, go to production. Well, it's a shortcut, huh, obviously. Huh? <laughs> it won't happen like that. But this is the ambition. So to, and that's why we are going to use uh, software factories for, for models as well. So uh, those are our current choices uh, within Axiom. Okay, so uh, tra traditional tools for data science, but integration with the standard DevOps, uh, DevOps uh, environments. Uh, this is the key uh, for the architecture. Um, okay, thank you very much for this uh, answer. And uh, John, so pipeline robustness is at the core uh, at, of your activity at Liftoff. So what do you advise in terms of monitoring and unit testing strategy for building AI products? Right. This is uh, very important for, for my team and myself in particular because we are all on call when something goes wrong. So uh, we get woken, woken up in the middle of the night if there, there's an issue with our ML pipeline and we do not like, like waking up in the night. Um, but yeah, but basically machine learning uh, and traditional software engineering, there are two different ways of programming uh, a machine. And while sort of testing is well understood for traditional software engineering, there are a lot of open questions about how to do it for machine learning systems, uh, and uh, and it's hard. Uh, so there, um, I think so. Jacob and Eloise earlier were mentioning um, change uh, data that changes over time. That's very true. Uh, some of the worst failures you'll have are are silent data errors that are very hard to detect, uh, and they will wreck your performance. Uh, but you might also have to deal with um, oh, uh, machine learning systems are very hard to test in isolation. Uh, and so if you change, let's say, one input, one feature, all of your other weights are going to change. Uh, and so you can't uh, test things uh, in little blocks like you can with traditional software. Uh, and you have a fuzzy definition of success, right? In a, in a traditional program, uh, given certain inputs, you will always get the same output, roughly. Uh, and you can test that, and you can verify that's correct. Uh, in machine learning, you are going to make errors. That's part of the game. Uh, but what you want is your average accuracy to be above some threshold. So there's a soft notion of correctness. Uh, and that those make it very hard to um, monitor a ML pipeline. Uh, so there, there are a few things that, that have worked for, for us over the years. Um, so your, your mileage may, may vary. I'm, I'm happy to share them. Um, and uh, we've, we haven't had a serious ML pr uh, pr uh, problem in the past three years. So at least th these things work for us. Uh, and and you know, there are a few things you really need to monitor. So before training, you must have a really good and deep uh, up-to-date understanding of your data pipelines. So what is the data distribution, different points in that pipeline? How quickly does it change? Uh, if it does change, how quickly will you notice? Uh, you know, if someone sends you garbage data, how long does it take you for you to notice that? Um, uh, how frequently do you need to retrain your models? <laughs> that plays into the... Uh, the freshness point uh, Jacob was making. Um, can you guarantee that you don't have any training serving you? So are, is your serving code seeing the exact same data distribution as your training code? Uh, you know, if, if that's not the case, you might have a very, very serious problem. So these are all things that you need to, to monitor uh, before you even start training. Uh, after you've retrained a model, um, before you deploy it, you, you need to um, sanity check it. And a, a good way of doing that is uh, by comparing the performance of your new model to the performance of the current model on the same test set. So you can see the, it's an easy test to do. You can just look at the accuracy on that test set. If they're very similar, it's probably very safe to put that new model into production. Uh, if uh, they're very different, you probably want to be extra careful. Uh, one thing we do at Liftoff is we do uh, live A-B tests for um, risky model uh, deploys. We send 50% of our traffic to one model, 50% to the other. That has the added advantage that we can directly measure business metrics, which are not always available uh, in your uh, ML trading pipeline. Uh, and then finally, uh, once you've trained your new model, it's in production, your job is not finished. Uh, so this ties into a point Eloise was making earlier. Um, 
uh, it is your responsibility as an engineering team to make sure that any problems that uh, uh, your model run into are detected before the human users of your models uh, notice uh, that something is misbehaving. And so ideally you have some form of live monitoring of your ML system. Uh, this will vary by company. Uh, at Liftoff, for example, we combine a live machine learning metric, which is very simple for us. It's like the number of predicted installs divided by the number of installs. That's a Grafana chart. It should always be equal to one. And we also track an, uh, um, a business metric, which is our net revenue margin, which is tied to the performance of our models. We also have that in real time. So if you see a sharp change in either of those metrics, and that happens around the time when you deploy a new model, uh, you know you have a modeling problem and you should be rolling back. Uh, if you have a sharp change and it's not uh, correlated with a model change, you probably have a data problem that you should go fix right away. Uh, so those are a few ideas. Um, I, I could speak for an hour about this, uh, but it, it's very important to do well. Yeah, thank you, John, for the, this, uh, all these uh, answers. Actually, yes, uh, monitoring uh, pipelines, monitoring models is hard and is uh, uh, not one task, but many, many tasks. Uh, we have the time for a last question, so maybe Eloise. Um, you so uh, you you know that uh, AI is a small part of an AI software, but uh, what are the differences, the key differences between building an AI solution and a traditional software? John mentioned some of them, but if you have uh, additional thoughts, I think the key difference is um, that um, an AI software uh, works on data that's living data. So it's going to be behave differently, and uh, apparently non de it's, it's deterministic, of course, but it, it will look like it's non-deterministic because it's going to change over time. Um, and I agree with you, designing a unit test, and even more than that, a non-regression test for an AI software is very, very hard. Um, so I, I would say that's, that's the main difference. For the rest, actually, uh, continuous uh, deployments. Uh, we actually, uh, I agree with the Renan, we at SNCF right now in the last three months, since the last three months, we actually use the same software factory as the rest of all the software in the, in the, at SNCF. So it's, it's more, about the data that's changing, and that is going to change your uh, software behavior. So in, in this aspect, you have to, you can look, um, you can solve the problem in two ways, uh, depending on whether the decision is taken by human, um, that's actually what you mentioned, Renan, and for an industrial system, for maintenance and surveillance, for managing, um, um, passenger flows in station, we're always going to leave a human in the loop because the data is never going to catch enough of the context. You have a situational, uh, situation awareness that only a human can have and machine learning will never have, at least it's my opinion. So if you have that system, uh, you can actually leave some mistakes, some potential mistakes in your results, as long as you provide something like a diagnosis so that a human can take a decision knowing that your model can make a mistake and it provides we, you with additional information to take the decision. Uh, and that's why change management is important because people need to be aware AI is not fully reliable. The other uh, possibilities, the other scenario is when you don't have a human in the loop and then you have to avoid uh, to reduce any risks uh, in taking those decisions. We have actually a project in production right now, it's uh, obvious for SNCF, we predict uh, train delays, <laughs> uh, not strikes, but uh, delays. <laughs> and uh, so it's in production right now, we predict every night uh, delays for suburban trains of tomorrow. It's actually, next step is real-time prediction to uh, actually provide a better information, a better, better computation of what's the best itinerary. Uh, so 
we're working on that, and what I see coming in the near future is preparing the developing games in 2024, because we will need to manage a huge amount of passenger in Paris area and other cities, and we will not be able to, uh, to provide good information. We, we can't make a mistake in redirecting a flow of passenger in that direction on in another direction, because uh, the there will be security or even uh, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be very difficult to manage. And um, the human in the loop is not possible because decision must be taken fast. So I would actually follow uh, uh, your, your recommendation and building actually a, a whole system managing the model around the AI model. Thank you very much, uh, Eloise, for this uh, insight. So yes, human in the loop, but not, uh, not always. Sometimes you need to be fast. Um, and of course, uh, regarding the difference with AI, so with the traditional software, the notion of unit test is probabilistic. Uh, this is the end of the roundtable. So uh, of course, feel free to ask uh, many more questions to all the participants. They are here in Data Job uh, for you. So uh, don't hesitate. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.